Hello and welcome to the Black Tower. I'm your host, your guide, your brother, Sorcerer Aramana Soul. Uh, I've been, uh, for the last five days, I have been fighting myself and everything. And, uh, and it all started with doing these videos, these channels and things. Uh, I wanted to teach, I wanted to share, so forth and so on, and the journey of the Necronomicon and all this, that, and the other. And also introduce sorcery into the into the mix, you know, and how you do it. However, I found myself doing more of the Necronomicon stuff than actually, you know, and I made a couple of videos on sorcery, you know, knowledge lectures and things like that. But I want to, but I always held back. Uh, so a shout out to Malak Todd, the peacock angel of the Yezidai. And with that in mind, let us like the peacock shake our tail feathers. It's time to learn some dark arts. Now, I consider myself a sorcerer, uh, a, a black magician, if you will. Uh, and but I don't, I don't stick to just the light or the dark. I combine the two. I make them one. I make them uh, a part of who I am and what I am. And you know because. There is no part of us that is not of the gods. There is no part of us that is not of shadow and of light. And with that in mind, you have to, you have to stick to that with, within magic, within constructs of ritual, spell working, uh, inner journeying, and stuff like that. So all of last year, we learned about order and with the elder gods and everything. And I promise as I continue further, to not just introduce my brand, my style of workings, along with some spells and some really cool shit, but I also wish to go further into the workings of the Azanai, uh, into the shadow realm, at the subconscious, and so forth and so on. But, before we do that, let's get on with this. Okay, so, so this is Taurus. Huber. Huber is the mother goddess, okay? It says in the Simon Necronomicon that she bore the 11 monsters and with Kingu as the leader. Uh, now, with that in mind, uh, so if you take the constellation of Taurus, it has 11 stars, which are symbolic of the 11 monsters that she bore, whether you know that or not, okay? So, uh, so as you continue with the Azanai, don't be confused. Don't think that, you know, the ones afterwards, the, that the second, which is Taurus, and then the rest are all the monsters, because it's not so. All the 11 monsters are found under Taurus. So when working with Huber, you can go in and find out all about the winged dragons and the serpents and the vipers with fangs and the scorpion men and so forth and so on, because it's all there. And I will make another video going more in depth on that. But today, Today I wanted to show some. I wanted to shed some of my own black light, my own blackened flame, if you will. I want to show. Uh, uh, it's a spell I came up with years and years and years ago. Last video I was talking about uh, being accused of fucking up someone's life who just straight up can't take responsibility for their own life. Uh, that is not drama happening. The only drama happening is in their life, in their head, in their world. Because I, I do not quit, I do not stop, and I do not fail. Uh, my uh, namesake, Araman Asul, that I go by, the sorcerer, Araman Asul, I work with Araman. Uh, you took the noise, stuff like that, uh, Zohawk, uh, Azidehaka, Andar, Savar, stuff like that. And that is my shadow workings. And so when I'm working with the uh, Azanai, I use the same methods as working with that, and for anybody who does not own a copy of the Luciferian Witchcraft by Michael W. Ford, pick it up, find a digital copy online, read it, go through it, and you'll get some kind of an idea and understanding of antinomialism. Antinomialism, I think is how you pronounce that word, is about going against the order, it's about creating your own order, it's about recognizing the god or goddess that you are, the sacred spark within you within each of us because I've gone on and on at length about how we are all gods there is no part of us that is not of the gods we are gods and goddesses and to remember that is all the goal but now let us get on with a with a spell now this this spell came to mind because of the uh, drama on the phone call well the first day 
uh, the night before I had done the uh, connecting with the current of Belial, Belial. Now, mind you, I've heard of Belial. I've called upon Belial to help people, but I have never one time just straight up been like, oh, I'm going to go work for Belial. That just, I was never drawn to it, wasn't pulled to it. But for some reason, then I, I found myself, I was sitting here and I was just chilling and everything else and doing something. And all of a sudden, someone was like, get on, get on YouTube, get online. I was like, what? I followed it and I found that uh, uh, from, the, from the Light of the Darkness, which is a channel with J.D. Temple, that him and J.S. Garrett had came up with this uh, Belial thing. And they were taking names of people who wanted to be initiated, that they would send Belial's blessings your way and so forth and so on and connect you with the current. And I went with this. Uh, I did not do so half-heartedly or anything. I wasn't, I wasn't bored. I did it because I've been feeling held back. Uh, for some reason, I w were working with the elder gods. Uh, I was having a hard time transitioning from the Zonai to the Azonai. Even though I had a whole three months between my last gatewalking of Saturn to working with the Azonai, I still had not been fully prepared even though calling upon Tiamat, working with Tiamat, uh, working with the three horned queens, Nin Karsag, Nin Kazi, Nin Gazita, uh, so forth and so on, and all this, that, and the other, I was still having a hard time uh, snapping out of the order that I had created with the Elder Gods uh, of my physical world. But now it is time to work on the internal world, the hidden world, the shadow world, the shadow realm subconscious what I call the garden of the gods because these are where the true dark gods and goddesses dwell and dark doesn't mean evil scary gonna kill you gonna hurt you stuff like that yes shit can go sideways seven ways to Sunday but guess what life does that without any of them having to be involved but the thing is is that these powers that you're awaken and reawaken and work with they help you create a better you they help you clear out the clutter that you're not aware of in your subconscious that's affecting your magic, that's affecting the well-being of your life. It is painful. It is like birth. But unlike birth, it is more of a death because you are dying. You, have, you, have, you, you went from being a normal person to walking the gates of the Zonai, the Elder Gods. That was a death. That was a conscious mental death. And working with the Azanai, it is a subconscious Death. Holy crap, look at that. It's all filed together under death. Now my key, which is a circle and the three arms, the three arms represent the three deaths. Uh, you know, because one death, one with the, uh, from normal into spiritual order, or to the physical order, into the, the mental order, and then the third will be to the spiritual order, which we haven't got to that part, because that's in the third year. Everything that you need is in the Necronomicon. It's right there. Uh, you just have to have a mind for it or, you know, some, as long as you have, as long as you're knowledgeable of other, uh, I guess, left-hand path practices, you have a better idea of how when you're reading the Necronomicon to be like, holy crap, abominations, demons, ooh, my buddies, my friends, my pals, because they are your hidden lust, your hidden desires. Your weaknesses and your strengths and everything. And they help to make you stronger. They enforce the sacred flame that you lit from the time that you lit and you first called upon Gishbar or Gabil, whatever name you want to go by. You lit the flame of Gira within yourself. You lit the God flame. You lit this flame and it is a black flame. If you've done these workings, you've done this whether you are consciously aware of it or not, you've done it. There's a reason why I say that it is best that you not have done it than to have done it and stop. Because it's a very dangerous task to take upon yourself. But, be not afraid. Be a fearless freak. Go to it. Wave your flag and run like hell. Have fun with it. Enjoy it. You know, uh, it's probably the only time that you can truly become who you truly are. It's, it's, it's how you wipe away the masks and the illusions of self. And how you realize who and what you truly are. Of your true face. Of your true name. With that being said. Let us continue. Now in this darkness and the shadow. The second death. Working with the Azanai. You are working through your weaknesses. 
you are working through the illusions. Sometimes we think, oh, we're so great, and we're this, and we're that. Uh, you know, garden of the gods. Here we go. It's time to weed, weed the garden. It's time to clean it up. There's a reason why the Mesopotamian Sumerian pictographs, uh, pictoglyphs, pictogryph, I don't know, whatever, pictures in the stone, people carved on it, where they're showing these gods messing with the halupa tree, tending to a sacred tree. And then you see these abomination looking things, these winged demon things touching it too. You ever wonder what that's about? In the garden of the gods, which is our subconscious, is this halupa tree. It is no different than Yggdrasil of the Norse mythology, okay? It's the exact same thing. It is the tree of life. It is the tree of the Klippoth. It is all of this. The tree of life is what you work through with the Zonai of the Elder Gods, with the Azonai. We are doing Klepothic workings. It is very dark. It is very sinister. Some of the craziest weird shit will come. You will have some of the most horrendous challenges, things like that. But like I said, be not afraid. Be fearless. Run with it. Work with it. Because when you work through this, you will become stronger than you could ever imagine. You'll find out who you really are, who you truly are, what really makes you tick, what really turns you on, what really brings you to life, what makes you happy. Because, see, when you discover and you learn all these things, these things come to you in real life. You remember how I was always saying that, you know, however the internal world is, the universe has no other option but to mimic it most perfectly and draw to you the things that you desire and you want. This is magic without spell casting. This is drawing your desires to you without having to put any effort into the drawing or pulling it to you. But this is how you do it. You must enter into the Garden of the Gods. You must fall to rise. A uh, magical phrase that I used years ago, Deunum, as you fall, I rise. Now, this isn't some. you can use it as a form of cursing somebody else. Uh... But the idea, the true uh, hermetic principle behind Deunum is you're looking at the reflection of yourself, of your false identity, your false face, if you will, your illusion of self. And you're saying, as you fall, I rise. The true God rises. The true personality rises. You are formed in the fires. And that's what it's all about. That's what it's truly about. That is for the people who work on ascension and on becoming through kepha, uh, kefir, uh, uh, ascension, uh, obtaining, so forth and so on, enlightenment, what have you. Whatever word you use for it, it doesn't matter. It all is the same thing. But with that in mind, and with all the crap I was dealing with, the very first thought came to my mind was a curse that years ago I created. But before I can tell you about this, I gotta tell you where it came from. Okay, so as a child I grew up in the church and all this other stuff. Unlike most kids who are like, yeah, Jesus loves me and Jonah got ate up by the whale and all this other stuff. I was sitting there going, if Jonah got ate by a whale, how did Jonah get out of the whale? You know, because physically, literally, there's, you know, if you get ate by a fish, guess what? You ate by a fish. You ain't getting out. This ain't this ain't Pinocchio and Geppetto and the great big whale, okay? But anyway, I'm not getting onto that topic. But let us get to the true story, the one I really want to tell. The one concerning Jesus and his disciples. You've all heard the story. Jesus and his 12 disciples. Now in the Christian realm, in the Christian world, in their mythos and their belief and their system and all this other stuff, there were 12 disciples. There are 11 that are okay, and there is one that they don't even think about, they don't talk about, they don't have anything to do with. And who might that be but the great and mighty Judas Iscariot? Now, what was really cool about Judas, and before I get into that, okay, so all of these disciples gave up their life. Like if they were working at plant, like if it was modern day and they were working plants and government and being a tax collector, IRS, whatever. It was like them just quitting their job and following this dude and his mental, spiritual teachings and just teaching this stuff to the people. 
This is what the disciples did. They gave up their life, their, what they were doing for a living, taking care of their families and stuff to follow this guy. Okay? Now, there, there are two ways of looking at it. From the Christian viewpoint, Judas went and hung himself because he was ashamed for having betrayed Jesus and blah, 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 and yaggy schmackety. But what you have to think of from a left-hand path, from a sinister side, why did Judas do it? Well, here's an idea for you. Here's the one I've got for it. Okay, you take a man who threw away everything he had, and all of a sudden this guy that you're following, this guru, he decides one day, oh, I'm just going to give myself over to him and let him kill me because it's part of God's will. Oh, dear God. Judas is sitting there like, and I can see it in my head, Judas is sitting there like, what? So, we threw away our livelihoods and everything we were doing to follow you for this belief and this practice and this way of living? You just gonna, you just gonna let them kill you? And I can imagine he's sitting there like, holy shit, not like the rest of them, like Peter cut off the ear of a soldier. I mean, holy crap, that is so unlike Jesus. I like Peter. Peter's cool. But no, you can't touch my man. Cuts his ear off him. He's like, no, you mustn't do that. Puts his ear back on him. Peter's like, what? Yes, I can. Yeah, you should have just let me cut his other ear off. But getting back to Judas. So Judas is like, you know, well, fuck it. If he's going to give himself up, I'm going to make some money out of this. So he goes to the temple and he tells him where he's at. The so-called betrayal. He was thinking his future, he's like, man, if I threw away all this, I'm at least going to be able to get back on my feet or something similar to it. Oh, and then he goes back, and because Jesus was this charismatic figure and all this other stuff, it hurt Judas. Judas understood then that, holy crap, he was going to do it anyway. And yes, Judas may have been all about the self-preservation and the taking care of himself, but he came up with this man, you know what I'm saying? He he fought him forever. He was he was their their uh, treasurer. He took care of the money. He went places, preparing places for him to come before they ever came to a city. He was already going to the city, making sure that they had somewhere to sleep and eat, stay, and all this other stuff. And uh, at any rate, so he goes and he he like tries to give him back the silver, thirty pieces of silver, and he's like, "Here, take this." Blah blah blah. Well, the priests were like, yeah, uh, "Um, buddy." Price paid in full. Thank you. You know, it's kind of like getting a reward for turning in a criminal nowadays. That's kind of what happened. So anyway, getting off the story, because I wasn't trying to get all biblical, but I wanted to throw that out there, a, a viewpoint of it. Now, how can we make that work? We're a left-hand path practitioner. Well, first off, I would not just do this spell willy-nilly. I would not just do this to just anybody. You make sure it is somebody who has betrayed you, who has truly betrayed you. Now, here's what I kind of mean by that. Surely you understand what I mean by making sure that they betrayed you, that they betrayed your trust, that they've tried to bring destruction upon you, so forth and so on. <clears throat> and before you do this spell, make for certain that you yourself are not responsible for betraying somebody else because this spell is very powerful, very strong, and <laughs> just powerful. It works. It works really well, a little too well. All right. So what you're going to need is about seven and a half dollars. Go to your bank, go to your store or whatever, and get seven and a half dollars worth of quarters. That's 30 pieces of silver. Now, what you're going to do is you're going to turn each of the quarters face up. You're going to close your eyes and feel the pain, feel the rage, the anger, and the, and the just, the righteous anger is what, it's concern, is what it's considered. This feeling of betrayal and how much it hurt and how much, you know, how wrong it was and so forth and so on. Infuse your body until you feel the sadness, till the till the tears almost draw, uh, draw, going down your face, till you know you're just almost overcome, which is pure anger. And you're going to want to take a a lancet, pierce your middle finger. 
because the bird finger, uh, it, is, it is equated to Saturn, and Saturn is order, and it is connected to set. Check this, and this is where it ties in. In the most ancient of days, they used to put a goat a mile out, a black, unblemished, spotless goat a mile outside of a city so that Set would pass by and not bring destruction or ruin upon the city or the town. Later, now this is in the Egyptian mythos. During the Hebraic time, that same goat became known as the Judas goat, which is the same Judas Iscariot. Yes, yes, yes. And because, you know, all the blame was put upon Judas. What makes this, this spell so powerful, what makes it so effective, is the fact for close to 1,500, 1,800, 2,000 years or so, people have believed the stories, they've been told the stories, and it's subconsciously programmed in their head that it was real, that it was a thing, and so forth and so on. And every negative connotation is connected with this. And so the 30 pieces of silver that you're going to be using are infused with the subconscious belief system of millions of people who have heard or read or believed or whatever. And that makes this spell so powerful, you wouldn't even believe it. Okay, so Pierce, like I said, see the person in your mind's eye. Imagine all the pain, all the feelings, build their rage. Use a lancet to pierce. Look at each quarter. You're going to do this one quarter at a time. Put a drop of blood on the face of each quarter. Seeing the face as the person that has betrayed you. Now we're going to use a word out of the Necronomicon. Edenazu. It means go to the desert. Ooh, scapegoat, huh? Now you see how this works. And see it consume them. That the blood covers over them. Your blood, your righteous anger, your justice. Your justice. The justice that you place upon them. And do this at each one. Edenazu. Edenazu. Take your time. Feel it. By the time you get to the 30th piece of silver, you should be pretty drained. All that hatred, all that anger, all that justification of its righteous anger fading from you. So it's a good thing it's so many pieces of silver. And you're going to need a purple, a purple bag. Uh, Crown Royale bags are the best because they're, they're royal purple. And because it's Jupiter and because it's money. And because you are visiting upon them the woes of Jupiter, and Jupiter is of justice, so it works like Donkey Kong. Put the 30 pieces of silver in it, draw it up, draw the strings on it, wrap it up, do not open it, do not get it out. Take this. If it's at a person's house where they're the only ones, set it on their doorstep, ring their doorbell, and get ghosted. Or if you're a brave, cocky motherfucker, I am one of those kind of people, go up to them. Say, hey, you can have his change, man. It's, about, it's, it's a couple of dollars. You're welcome to it. Price paid in full. Now, they're going to look at you kind of funny about price paid in full. They don't know what that's about. If you have to leave it on someone's doorstep, put on a piece of paper, price paid in full. Now, what this will do is from them looking upon the money, all that hatred and, and all that anger and all that justification for your reaction to what they've done to this curse that you've placed upon this money, it is unleashed when they see it. And when they read the piece of paper, because people are curious by nature, so they're going to look at the piece of paper and they're going to see the price paid in full. Their mind's not going to understand it. But because the eyes are the window of the soul, not only do you direct energy out of your eyes, but you take energy in, which is known in certain left-hand practices and certain shamanistic practices, certain Vudan practices. This sort of thing is known, is true. Now, this is why you sealed up the bag, because as soon as they look in to see the money, they take in the energy that you have just placed on it. When they read the piece of paper, or they hear the statement, price paid in full, it seals the curse. Now, like I said, 
Cause and be your guide. As long as you're not responsible for having betrayed somebody else, this spell is the bee's knees. It is the jizz of righteous return. Uh, that being said and done, I wish each and every single one of you peace, blessings, and power. Till next time.